Hello? Is a collect call from Life of a Lifer. To accept this call, press 5 now. Hello and welcome, friends and family. Today we got a very special guest joining us, Dave Dahl, founder of Dave's Killer Bread. And I just want to welcome him on today and thank you for joining us. Go to designconvictionthemagazine.com to see Dave on the cover. Subscribe and stay updated on all the new releases. And feel welcome to go ahead and get a hold of us, whether it be via Instagram or Facebook, and ask any questions that you may have because we are always willing to answer questions, get involved, engage, and interact with what we got going on. This is a platform that we are trying to build here to get a voice out from the incarcerated. My name is Taylor Conley, and I'm the host of The Life of a Lifer. So I would like to welcome on Dave Dahl. You there, Dave? I sure am. How's it going? Oh, not too bad, man. Just another day in the joint. How you doing yeah. today? Oh, I'm hanging on. Hanging on. There's so much to do. so much going on. Currently hanging out at my, uh, my little art garden museum. I'm just running around looking at stuff, seeing if everything's, you know, legit. So that's basically what I'm up to today. An art museum. A lot of people call it a museum, but it's more of a warehouse. Is where I, I sell stuff on mine, but I have a massive collection of stuff. Is that right? What kind of stuff you got? Well, it's African drive life. So it's like stuff you've never seen before. And for a while there, um, I was going through some stuff after I had a mental place down the streets of Portland back in 2013. And I needed something to distract me from Dave Dahl, and this was perfect for that. Now I'm kind of stuck with dealing with all the work that I have created for myself. When you purchase a lot of art, you got to take care of it. <laughs> What's your favorite type of artwork? Well, I, I got into masks. You know, it's all tribal art, so it's masks, people, ceremonial objects and stuff. And so imagine the crazy outfits that they would wear while they were doing their rituals. And that's what I have. I have a bunch of these masks left over from those rituals. We do so many different things. We do art shows. We donate art to charity sometimes. You know, it's it's a business that I've never found a way to make money at. And I just kind of keep playing around. And we sell stuff, but it costs more money to run the business than we make selling it. So it's just more of a, a passion play. With the artwork, that we do and the the stuff that we got going on with arts of all different various forms, it's interesting to talk to you that you're an avid and passionate art collector yourself. And I just was interested in the experience that you've had with doing all this time in prison with everything that you've gone through getting out of prison and getting into this art world that you're in. What does your time in prison have to do with this art, if anything? Well, I've always been sort of an artist. I just never really focused on it. I did some art while I was in prison, but I didn't get serious. I was more into playing my guitar. And then, you know, I think when I got out, I didn't get into art right away because I was too busy working. I was working hard creating something, you know, creating this killer bread and building that brand. But more recently, in 2013, after I've been at it for eight years. I've had success with the bread and, you know, I'm extreme success, the kind of success that kind of is hard to, uh, to see it coming. And then I, I had a mental breakdown. The art just somehow started appealing to me as a way to, you know, something I had to do for me. So, I mean, being an artist, uh, somehow having an art mind just it started with me buying things off the internet you know on ebay and stuff for my house and eventually it led to me getting going down a little rabbit hole of art and it's all carved art you know what i mean it's all it's all sculpture and for some reason that just appealed to me and it helped me get through a rough time yeah art seems to have that healing property you know and and i really believe that Art has been paramount in helping me to become the person that I am today. 
especially when you're going through hard times, art is something that really is amazing because there's so many different variations. There's so many different forms, whether it be sculptures, painting, carving. It's such a great uh, use of time just when you're creating art. When you're into art, you know, time just goes by and, <laughs> you know, you just don't think about your problems so much. Right, man. I feel like art is kind of almost becoming lost in a way that everything is so commercialized nowadays that a lot of the art programs that they have in schools and, and stuff is becoming cut because they don't have the funding for it. So those are like the first type of budgets that get cut is, is stuff for the arts, man. And those are like the creative outlets that people need in their lives. Yeah, art's pretty crucial. And, you know, I think the same is true with the trade programs. Guys learning to work with their hands. There's a certain sort of art mindfulness involved with carpentry and things like that that people aren't really taught anymore. But when they when they discover it, like I did, you know, I was, as being an artist, I guess that's why computer drafting appealed to me so much. In prison, that was kind of where my turnaround happened. Was with the computer drafting, I got medication, I got education, and my life just started turning around. So in my case, it was. It was computer drafting, but, you know, it's very similar in the way that, you know, it works with art. You know, drafting is really art, too, in its own way. The science involved and the science involved in art. So it's it's just a great use of your time. It's like we're being 100% into our life when we get to do that. So you're a drafter and doing designs for floor plans and stuff like that? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. That's what I learned. The last few years I was in prison, I learned computer drafting. I drafted machine parts. I drafted, yeah, you name it, I, I, I drew it. You know, pencil to paper, I drew it with a computer, but it's the same kind of thing. And that was kind of the beginning of my new life before Dave's Killer Bread. It made Dave's Killer Bread possible, really. It's part of my transformation. Absolutely. So you said that when you made Dave's Killer Bread, you say it took about eight years. Well, I got so much success rather quickly. And, you know, for a few years, several great years, Dave's Killer Bread was amazing. Then I started drinking and things like that. I got distracted, lost myself, and ended up having a mental breakdown in 2013. So that was eight years into it. So it happened all really fast. I became a millionaire, and then I had a mental breakdown all, you know, fairly short time because there was just so much stuff involved, you know. Uh, so many things were happening. And, you know, I broke down, but it was the art that brought me back. It was my saving grace. It's got to be a shock to come from doing all that time in prison and then – have all this success and all this money and everything and not maybe be exactly ready for that. It wasn't money, you know, I mean, I wasn't prepared for money. Money wasn't even what was on my mind, you know. I was just living my life. And so the way things kind of happened, I really wasn't ready for that. I probably would have been a little better off if things had been quite so successful. But you got to take the good to bad and I'm really happy today. That's great, man. And you got a legacy that you built there. I got the opportunity to try some of that bread just recently, and it's amazing bread. But it also has your story on every bag of bread there. Yeah, it's That's kind of great. a watered-down version of my story. But, yeah, it's there. It's, it's still there. Right, right. I mean, I'm sure, yeah, there's way more to it than the little condensed version of it. It looks like help a lot of other individuals that are coming out of prison to help them with their transition back into society as well. They should have been pretty good for that, no doubt. I think we've done a lot of good. You know, I'm not part of the company anymore, but I believe that the they should have been legacy is pretty great. It came from the heart because, you know, I felt really good about myself and about everything about my place in the world when I got out of prison. For the last time, you know, a lot of things that happened, a lot of good things that happened, and I was ready for what.
whatever came at me. When I had a little bit of enough success to where I had to hire people, it seemed obvious to hire ex-cons or at least give them a chance. Not to hire them without really vetting them, but I really felt like I could benefit from having ex-cons working for me and they could do the same. That's why we created Design Conviction. This is a social enterprise and we are working to help communities of people that, that need it, especially the incarcerated and people that get out and trying to really do something positive to impact that through art. Art is the major factor yeah. in what we're doing here. 50% of yeah. any money that we make will be put back into helping people. I believe it's a great, it's a great way to do business. I personally promoted my product and my product I couldn't donate 50% of what I made. It was not possible. It was a, it's a family business and it really wasn't that much money. The money had to go back into the business. But I gave my time freely because I believed in the mission and it eventually helped my bottom line as well as created a lot of goodwill in the community. Absolutely. I think that without a doubt, that is how, you know, the communities will become stronger is, is helping the communities and people looking out for each other and, you know, being there when you can within reason. Something that's great. Yeah, absolutely. We we give back where we where we can. I, I wanted to ask you about music. I heard you say earlier that you played the guitar and I had the chance to hear something that you had done over the phone and it sounded amazing, man. Yeah, I played played blues and stuff. I and I played quite a bit while I was in prison. I haven't practiced much since I've been on the streets, but I play with a band. I, I love playing music. Do, do you write your own songs? Yeah, I, I've written you know, quite a few songs, but lately I haven't really written much. I wrote while I was in prison. And I wrote a few songs when I, was, when I got out, but. Right now, my focus has been on other stuff, so I haven't written any of that. I was wondering if you ever record any of it? Yeah, I've got a few songs recorded, but I need to go back in the studio and tighten them up and before I release anything. Yeah, man, that would be awesome. I would love to hear it. It'd be great to figure out a way to get it in there and let you guys hear it, because, you know, it, it definitely will probably appeal to a lot of folks on, <laughs> on a certain level, you know. I think your story inspires people to say it's possible to make your dreams come true. You know, that's why I tell my story. Absolutely, man. You're inspiring people. You really are. So, I got a question. What are your thoughts on life without the possibility of parole sentences? I'm curious about what your thoughts are on it. Well, I'm all about second chances, you know. I mean, my experience in life, I, I've got a few second chances. Fortunately, I never got in that kind of trouble. I got in a lot of trouble, but never to that level. All I can say is I, I believe in second chances for people who are rehabilitated. But here's my philosophy. Because I started finding that I can enjoy and, you know, feel productive and like, like, a, like a full full quality human being while I was in prison. And then it was great. I didn't really even want to leave right away. I wanted to, but I didn't want to leave until I was kind of done with what I was doing, you know. That's how good it was. But I ended up getting interrupted. I got out and made something happen. But bottom line is, I think wherever you're at, if you can kind of accept the situation and you can make the most of it, then your life can be beautiful wherever you're at. doesn't mean to quit. Quit trying to change it. It's great to be able to just learn to accept it and make the most of it. Otherwise, you're just going to go through life and it's going to pass you right by and you're not going to enjoy it. Regardless of the situation yeah. that you're in, you know, you're just going to be miserable. Yeah, and you can learn how to be happy. I believe, I really truly believe it because I've experienced it. It's a true story, man. It really is. I really appreciate you coming on here and talking with us, Dave. I've enjoyed it. You know, I, I'm going to support you. I wish you all the best, and, you know, and I'll be watching. Absolutely, and we're going to try to change the hearts and minds of, of people, you know. And we're going to keep going. We're going to keep telling the stories of the people who have done the art and the, and the people who have been through these situations and done something better with themselves and are making the most of their situations. We're going to keep giving a voice to people. I love the positivity, you know what I mean? It's never going to be done with resentment and 
negativity of any form. It's always going to be that positive force that you have. So keep that stuff up. That's what attracted me to what you're doing is that overall sense of just positivity all the time. One of my philosophies that I live by is you got to turn that negative into a positive. you got to look for what you can do to make something good out of a bad situation. And then once you start doing that more and more, you just start finding all these good things that you can do. And even if I spend the rest of my life in prison, maybe what I can do is something positive for the place where I'm at here, out there. My true goal for myself personally is to prevent some young kid from doing the same dumb shit that I did. That's a meaningful thing. What if you save one guy? What if you save 10 guys? I mean... You know, one one person is is it made your life worthwhile. Your life's going to be worthwhile anyway because you're going to you know you're going to create a lot of stuff in your lifetime, no matter what happens. So I think that that attitude is just going to create a lot of positive stuff. Thanks, man. I look forward Dave, to to talking more to you and yep. seeing all the things that you're doing. You got it. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much, and I definitely do look forward to talking to you again. It was great talking to you, and lots of good things I see coming down the road, so uh, just keep it up, buddy. Well, that's Dave Dahl, everybody, and this is Taylor Conley. Have a great day, and please join us again next week on The Life of a Lifer. Go to designconvictionthemagazine.com to see Dave on the cover. Subscribe and stay updated on all the new releases. Thank you for listening. I'm Taylor Conley, and this is Life of a Lifer podcast. Be sure to visit the website lifeofalifer.com and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode.